Mendoza, and I'm here with Ellen Lauren, uh, who's going to be starring in Room. It's our new co-production with City Company. Um, so, Ellen, thank you very much for sitting down with me it's today. It's a great pleasure. So, tell us just a little bit about Room, um, what the process has been like in developing this. It's a over over ten years, about ten years that you've been working just on it? Just about a decade now, when we first went into this together, and it began uh, Anne Bogart, the director and artistic director of the City Company, came to me and wanted me to do the second part of a triptych that we inevitably built, which was based uh, on a very simple premise, which was looking at the creative mind, the creative spirit, through the lens of these very particular remarkable artists who have influenced Anne very deeply personally. <clears throat> and inevitably the city company. And I have to admit that I was not of the Virginia Woolf flag-waving, <laughs> badge-wearing club. I had picked it up, I think, in junior high and again in high school, um, the first time voluntarily, and I was just too young, too uh, unread at that time to really know what I had in my hand. So Anne came to me with this, and I really was thrilled that I would be one-on-one -on -one with Anne, thrilled to be the second part of this triptych and represent our, our questioning of the, what is the creative mind and spirit and process. But I was not, I have to admit, I was a little dismayed at this, these two words of Virginia Woolf. So I got a huge stack of her books, which, you know, can reach from right here to the ceiling if you really want to read them all. And I tried to go in them, and then finally I had the good sense, maturity, and maybe it was even something Anne said, or somebody encouraged me to look at the diaries and the letters. And it was through that voice that I became enchanted with Virginia mm -hmm. Woolf because I found the voice that I knew was in me. I found a connector, as small as it would be, because I wouldn't by any means say that I could hold court with Virginia Woolf. However, she, her sense of humor was something I immediately responded to. Um, her irony, uh, her sarcasm, her egotism, her snobbishness, all of these things which she also had a great self-examination of and was able to articulate so, so beautifully. So I entered the material that way. Um, how Anne and I first went after it was really unique because usually as a company we build everything collaboratively. Everyone's in the room helping out, piping up. It, it really is like, zip it, shut up. <laughs> Everybody right. says something. Fan fantastic. But Anne and I went upstate New York. We have uh, homes adjacent to one another in the country and the, the deal was that I would learn on the previous night as much of the text as I could, which was dense. And at a specific time, two o'clock in the afternoon, I would come over and I would find Anne in a room upstairs in her house, which she had just bought, an empty room at that time. I would walk into the room, I would turn, and I would begin to speak as much as I could. Now, we first started really, really in her barn, and I would come up the hayloft steps, and Anne would be sitting there, <laughs> and I would, and there was a little window, and there was randomly just, the only thing up there at that time was a little sawed off, the legs were sawed off, red little chair, in a very particular place, angle. Anne hadn't placed it there, and nor had I, but it was there, and so that became uh, our set. That became the mm -hmm. thing that we incorporated as the only other being on the stage that I really relate to. And I would walk to the center of this hayloft floor and turn and speak. It was terrifying. <laughs> and we continued this for, I guess, through about two and a half weeks. And then after I ran out of gas or words, I would leave. I would leave the room or walk down the hayloft steps and then we'd take a little break and then we would meet in her kitchen. We would have a coffee or we would share lunch and we would talk about the piece, the piece mm -hmm. what had happened. 
And one of the things we were doing was I, what we called inevitably ironing, which was I had to speak it perfectly, which is very difficult with Wolf, you know, as you... She sells her books. It, it, it's so <laughs> circuitous and extraordinary. And it really is following someone's thoughts, which inevitably for me becomes about breathing and how mm -hmm. to keep the thought going. Uh, th and that's a dragon I've been wrestling for ten years now. Mm -hmm. I'm a little... I was sitting on the subway this morning thinking, oh, I'm going to talk about this. I have to admit that if I knew then what I know now, I would have been really disheartened. I, I, I think for the first half of this experience, this ship ride, I really, I really, really um, didn't didn't make it over the the cliff with the words. I hung in there, and Anne and the company hung in there, and all the presenters that brought me in hung in there. But now I understand so much more about it, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm we looked at it again this summer, took it out of the mothballs, and I hadn't done it in three or four years. And it just fit like some fine, old, beautiful Potiswa glove, you know. It really, it, this is the chapter and season of my life to enter into this piece. So how has your relationship with Wolf changed? Um, you said that you haven't worked on this piece in about three yeah. or four years, so how is it going back and rehearsing it now for this, for this very, very limited run? I think that while I'm older, I have a little, I have a better idea of the stamina that it takes, and not just physically, because it takes enormous physical stamina that I always get in the middle of the piece and underestimate. I always think, I'm, I'm going down, I'm flagging here. But I've figured out the, the points in it now as a little bit more, little bit more mature actor and woman, the points in it where I can regroup. And I've also figured out how the brain has to pick up speed through it, that I actually have to start thinking quicker. It's less about a technical control of breathing and physical stamina as it is about a, a concentration but also a, a, an inner state, an inner sensibility, and quickening myself inside. And once those engines are running, rapidly and all the gears are fitted out and oiled up, if I can hang on with the right delicacy and grip, then she, her, whatever this thing that's still around us in the ether, thank God, of Virginia Woolf, carries me through. And I've begun to recognize where those places are, where, where even in reading it, the places where you often just lose heart or can't carry yourself through if you're not in shape because I really think you have to be in shape to read Virginia Woolf. It's it's a rigorous, fantastic workout and it's not for the amateur reader in the sense that certainly anybody can pick it up and the, her, her most accessible pieces the, to the lighthouse and Mrs. Dalloway still are mm, just about the best thing anybody could pick up, but it is an athleticism, intellectually, spiritually, exactly. and physically. So I know before we started talking, when we were just sitting on the couch and just before the record button went off, you were talking about how when you do this play each and every time, the world changes. Yes. And I think, you know, people think of Virginia Woolf as, you know, a little bit of like a dated feminist idea. So kind of dealing with that, how do you think this is going to be relevant for contemporary audiences, or what do you hope that they walk away with? Well, I said it earlier, I do think that there is, uh, on a very elementary level, something that Wolf, you know, she was really just an extraordinary iconoclast, and, and breaking ground in the literary world, breaking ground though as an artistic being perceiving the world and how then to articulate that vision to the world at, at large in a in completely new way. And, and she lived in this cusp between the, the demise and end of the Victorian age and the birth of modernism, 
an amazing time and she actually was able to ride the cusp of that wave and use the energy from it and look at the consciousness and, and try to talk about what self means. And right now there's this huge, huge uh, political movement in the Middle East. This is extraordinary in our time. And this is a woman, whatever you may say about her as a person, um, and I'm not an expert by any means on Virginia Woolf, but I do know that her writing accessed uh, a unique thing in the world that we're looking at through the lens of what's happening in Egypt, through the lens of what's perpetrated uh, on the Afghani people, on the Iraqi people. Um, and, I, and yes, and you can also look at it through the, the abused and the disenfranchised female voices in the world, of which if you, if you look into this latest statistics about human trafficking, the sex trade around the world, it's now taking over the statistics of the drug trade. And I, I don't mean to say that she was writing directly about these things, but she was writing about very potent, painful issues um, in a art, very, very artistic way. And I, I just think this material pokes it all right in the eye. It's so modern. It's so contemporary. I am I'm really the old-fashioned one, and it's something Anne says, which is in the beginning when you come in, and I'm on stage, and I'm speaking, and I, and people are, and, and I'm not very pleasant at the top, and people think, what, who is this old-fashioned lady in this box? But by the end of the piece, you realize, sitting out in the audience, that quite possibly you're the one sitting in the box, mm. that, that she was the one that was free. She was the one with the expansiveness of thinking and mind and curiosity and energy towards life and the world that exceeded most of all, all of us. And we can begin to feel a little bit more free. Well, this sounds like an amazing piece, and I know that Thank I personally you. can't wait to see it Thank in the rehearsal process. So. Hang in there. It's hard. It's hard on the audience. It's hard on me, but it's worth it. As we get through it together. It sounds like it. So thank you very much for sitting down with me today, pleasure. Ellen. It's All right. a great pleasure. Bye, guys.